become fascinated by the noose after seeing it over and over again on the television. It's a grim consequence of the country's fierce political battles. The grey cylinders of Taka's parliament building have long tolerated political bickering. But for the last month, this has spilled out into the streets and as a result, more than 100 people have lost their lives. It's a result of this, the domestic court which has been set up to try alleged war criminals from Bangladesh's 1971 liberation struggle. The men in the dock stand accused of committing murder, rape and forcing Hindus to convert to Islam. These are harrowing allegations against some of the most respected scholars in the country's Muslim ranks. The government says it's fulfilling an election promise which sought to bring closure to a horrific trauma. The opposition accuses it of carelessly opening a wound that threatens the stability of the nation. In our special report on Bangladesh tonight, we ask, are the defendants getting a fair trial? Is this really about delivering justice? Or is this courtroom an orchestrated chess game where the government gets to call all the moves and wipe out its enemies? One member of cabinet actually stated that anyone who gives evidence for Saidi will be considered to be a traitor of the nation and will be dealt with by the public accordingly. So that's the kind of environment that we were forced to operate under. The banner for the International Crimes Tribunal looks anything but impressive. As if hastily put together, it stretches above an area where security men monitor entrance to the court. Critics say the tribunal itself has been set up in pretty much the same haphazard manner. Since its creation in 2010, it's been mired by accusations of political interference and sleaze, not the kind of justice you want from a court hearing some of the most historically significant cases. In 1971, the then East Pakistan fought a bloody independence struggle after accusing West Pakistan of centralizing power. In the nine months of fighting, Bangladesh says 3 million of its people were killed and 200,000 women raped. Roughly 8 million Bangladeshis were displaced. But the scale of the Pakistani army's attack can't be explained with just numbers on a screen. In the summer of 1971, India's then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi embarked on a campaign of what she described as personal diplomacy in Moscow and the European capitals. She told a British newspaper editor it was to prepare the ground for India's armed intervention. The strategy worked and on December 16th, Bangladesh, with the help of India, celebrated independence. The war was to deepen regional hostilities between India and Pakistan, but in 1972 the three countries signed a tripartite act known as the Simla Agreement, in which Pakistan diplomatically recognized Bangladesh and the nations laid down the principles upon which future relations were to be governed. The Simla Accord made no mention of prisoners of war, but a 1974 supplementary agreement paved the way for repatriation. Subsequently, Civilians captured in East Pakistan were released and over 90,000 Pakistani military prisoners of war returned home. Among them 195 officers accused of war crimes or genocide. These men never stood trial. Forty-two years later and it's as if it was all just yesterday. Bangladesh Bangladeshi the so-called war criminals these protesters are talking about are not the Pakistani army officers who were allowed to walk free, but a group of Bangladeshi men accused of collaborating with Pakistan during the war. It's all part of the ruling party's election promise, in which Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina of the Awami League party pledged to try anyone responsible for war crimes. 
But opposition parties say the tribunal is a political tool which is designed to crush anyone who doesn't support the government. But unfortunately, Sheikh Hasina has taken a very rigid line. She is not listening to any side, any complaint or any sort of uh, appeal. She is determined and all these, uh, you know, the tribunals, and uh, it was prefixed, judges, investigators, prosecutors, they had some sort of a political affiliation uh, with our league, and uh, this is what the opposition parties are complaining. Bangladesh's various political parties all accuse each other of having members who are war criminals, even the ruling Awami League party itself. But the people standing trial are only members of the opposition, which calls into question the government's real motives. Perhaps the most shocking names are a group of conservative men who belong to jamaat e islami the country's largest Islamist party. The group campaigned against the independence war, but denies committing any atrocities. It's a key ally of the country's largest opposition group, the Bangladesh Nationalist Party. The men at the center of this so-called trial are household names, renowned for their knowledge of Islam and respected throughout the world's Muslim communities. They include Delwar Hussein Sayyidi, a 73-year-old scholar who joined the party in the late 70s and who's previously not been listed as a suspected war criminal. Prosecutors said Sayyidi was involved in the deaths of three people and that he'd led the Pakistani soldiers to kill dozens of others. They also accuse him of forcing 150 Hindus to convert to Islam. Sayyidi, who was a teacher at the time, denied all the accusations against him. Indeed, he's previously won two election victories in a largely Hindu area. Last month, he was convicted and then sentenced to death. The decision sparked off protests across Bangladesh and beyond. He has been convicted to the highest as uh, a death penalty and the other out of 20, uh, eight charges have been proved uh, without uh, reasonable doubts. Sayyidi's case raises particular alarm for human rights campaigners who say the death penalty shouldn't be used in a case which hasn't been fair. One of the most concerning, for example, is the use of the death penalty. We oppose the death penalty in all circumstances because of its cruel and unjust nature. But even more so, when you have the death penalty, the fair trial has to be um, absolutely correct. And in the cases of the ICT, We've seen a few issues. Do you know what? I received a phone call only a few days ago from a leading member of the current government, governing party. And I asked him, is Dilwar Hussain Saidi guilty of any crime? He said, no, we believe he is not. But in the interest of the Bangladeshi national, uh, uh, or in the Bangladeshi national interest, we must hang one or two people to set examples. Earlier this year, the tribunal sentenced a former Jamaat leader called Abul Kalam Azad to death for crimes during the war. Several weeks later, and another Jamaat leader was sentenced to life in prison on similar charges. Abdul Qadir Mullah's life imprisonment would prove to be an inadequate judgment for the government, and it hastily changed legislation to allow the prosecution to appeal the sentence, this time calling for the death penalty. After, at least in one of the cases, um, a death penalty wasn't imposed, even after someone had been found guilty. Um, the government has changed the law. So it's changed the law now to allow itself the right of appeal um, to have the death penalty. And this breach is one of the most fundamental rules of international justice, which is that you cannot have the law changed after the trial or after the event, especially on the death penalty. It's thought the government did this to appease a group of demonstrators who were calling for the Jamaat leaders to be hanged. They're being called the Shahbag protesters after the area they've occupied, and they're made up of young Bangladeshis. Many were not even born at the time of independence. Our movement is going on, and it will be keep on going until our demand is fulfilled of the descendants of all criminals. Six other top party leaders are currently on trial, including the 90-year-old former leader and founder of Jamaat Islami, Gulam Azam. His son is a Manchester-based former sports journalist. Salman al-Azami has fond memories of a father he says is consistent in good character and patriotic at the core. In 1971, he could have stayed silent, but he didn't because he was patriot. He didn't want the breakup of his own country. At that time, for him, Pakistan was his own country. So he was a, a patriot to 
let Pakistan stay as a united country. And now if Bangladesh, someone wants to break away from Bangladesh, what would someone um, you know, uh, do in Bangladesh? They would want to remain united Bangladesh. So that was its purpose at that time. Ghulam Azam stands accused of committing crimes against humanity at the ICT. He's accused of giving orders to kill, but he maintains there's no evidence to support this as he's never held any type of military position. The court trying him was rapidly set up a year after Sheikh Hasina took office. The government says it's called the International Crimes Tribunal because it's international crimes that the court is hearing. Outside of that, there's nothing international about the setup of this tribunal. The government of Bangladesh has been widely criticized for keeping this an entirely domestic affair with no international oversight whatsoever. The trial was Bangladeshi trial. Tribunal that was formed to try them was a Bangladeshi tribunal which will take account of local crimes as well as crimes that are known as international crimes, which is mass exodus caused by mass killing of people. It's an interesting concept, but it hasn't proved to be as straightforward as that. There's nothing to prevent a country from setting up an institution such as this. Um, many would say that they have an obligation to do this, and they should have done this 41 years ago. Um, unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, but there is nothing international about it. There is no involvement of the United Nations. There's no involvement of the international community, no funding, no assistance. Um, it's, it's a specialist tribunal that, that falls outside of the law. It doesn't fall within the usual judicial constitutional hierarchy uh, of, of Bangladesh courts. Uh, it excludes domestic law. Uh, it only applies a, a specialist statute that was adopted in 1973. The position that we have always advocated. Before the trials really got started, I travelled to Dhaka in August 2011 and I was denied uh, an entrance visa. Um, I was held at the airport for 10 hours and I was then deported and told uh, very clearly not to return. No. On the, what basis? Um, on the basis that I was representing war criminals. That's what, that's what I was told. Anybody who is not a member of the court cannot appear as a lawyer in that court. I go back to 1970, uh, 60, uh, 1969, when Bangabandhu Sheikh Mojibur Rahman was tried by Pakistan army for sedition, we sent a lawyer, Sir Thomas Williams QC MP, to Bangladesh to uh, appear on behalf of him. He was not allowed. He was allowed to advise, and he did that while he was there. As well as preventing proper legal counsel to defendants, the ICT has been accused of arbitrarily detaining suspects and denying them bail without due cause. There are also some serious allegations of torture, which both defence counsel and human rights campaigners say need to be addressed. I think the Jamaat leaders are being held in appalling conditions. Um, frequently they're not brought to court. Uh, they are all elderly gentlemen with uh, numerous ailments. Uh, particularly Professor Ghulam Azam, who's very elderly and very unwell. Um, Saidi suffered a heart attack uh, in prison and was given um, several days adjournment to the next hearing. All of them have ailments of some kind, and our position has always been that they have not been well cared for. The fact that the working group on arbitrary detention, based on our submissions, has decided to refer the matter to the Special Rapporteur on Torture is indicative of their assessment of the conditions. But I also represent uh, Mr. Saladin Kader Chowdhury, uh, as I've been advising his family for some time. There were allegations, serious allegations of torture when he was arrested. Now, whether those allegations are ultimately found out to be true or not, the fact of the matter is those allegations have been made, they're very serious, and there's no investigation. There was no torture. They agreed that there was no torture. The, the same people later on, their lawyers first said and then could not provide any evidence, number one. Number two, that the, the, the people who were arrested, if you go to Bangladesh, and I am pleased to hear that you your family is from Bangladesh. If you ask 
in any anywhere in Bangladesh, the name of Golam Azam, name of Saidi, name of um, Kader Mullah, people will say in last 43 years, everybody knows. Toby Cadman agrees that there was an investigation, but tells me it wasn't about the torture allegations. The investigation ordered by the government was how Mr Chowdhury had sent a letter to members of parliament in this country detailing his conditions and the torture that he had been subjected to. So an inquiry, a team of investigators was appointed to investigate how he had sent a letter, not whether he had been tortured or not. And then you have to look at whether these individuals should in fact be in custody at all. The government has always taken the position that anyone accused of these crimes has no right to bail. Now, as any lawyer will tell you, there is a presumption in favour of bail, not detention. It is not for us to, to prove that somebody should be released. It's for the prosecution to prove that they should not be released. Ghulam Azam and his colleagues have been imprisoned for over a year in what Salman al-Azami says are appalling conditions. Even in Ramadan, they didn't give him food for the uh, suhur. They gave him food at night, which he had to keep for the suhur. I mean, in a Muslim country. Sultan Sharif and I spoke for about an hour, but he refused to admit that there are serious concerns about the running of the tribunal. Last November, one of the key witnesses in the prosecution's case told defence lawyers he'd been forced to testify against Delwar Hussein Sayyidi. He had no idea about the chilling events that were to follow. Mr Bali was going to give evidence to the effect that, first of all, Saidi was not the person who killed his father, his brother, sorry, um, but also that he had been effectively told to lie uh, by the prosecution and the investigators. So we notified the tribunal that we would be calling this witness. It wasn't made um, common knowledge. Um, and as the witness the following day was brought to court, in the defence car. The car was stopped by security um, at the gates of the tribunal and plainclothes officers uh, took the witness, um, bundled him into the back of a van and he hasn't been seen since. Not long after and further discrepancies were exposed. In what's being dubbed Skypegate, the Economist newspaper revealed that the presiding judge had been influenced by a Bangladeshi lawyer based in Belgium. 17 hours of recorded telephone conversations and over 230 emails pointed to evidence that the two men shared confidential court details and that the man in Belgium was assisting and directing the ICT's esteemed adjudicator. The Economist newspaper made some, a series of revelations which exposed the trial as being a farce. It was an orchestrated political manoeuvre by the government of Bangladesh. It had nothing to do with justice, it has nothing to do with the judiciary. Uh, it gave evidence, of clear evidence, of matters of court, confidential matters of court being discussed with those people outside of the judicial process, perhaps aligned with your party, you have with asked, your government. You have asked, How can you explain You have this? asked five questions. What I am expecting, I am telling you. I'll ask you one question then. Okay. Is this a fair trial mm -hmm. if your government mm -hmm. is interfering mm -hmm. in the judicial process? Mm -hmm. All the questions you have asked are questions prepared in my, according to my thinking by those who want to escape this trial. This is a court which is manned by judges of High Court Division of the Supreme Court or senior judges of the country. And that's one of the problems. The judges in the ICT have been replaced a number of times after accusations of politicising a legal matter. Certainly the Economist newspaper um, discovered um, evidence which was acknowledged of discussion, perhaps collusion, between the president of the ICT um, and outside persons, and the president resigned. Um, but even more so, we find examples, for example, one of the trials after he resigned, none of the judges in the case then had heard all the evidence from the beginning. Um, so the, how it was impossible to have a fair trial in that case. So they should have stopped that trial and started again. Across the land, young Bangladeshis are passionately calling for Sayyidi and his colleagues to be hanged. 
Indeed, Sheikh Hasina herself stood up in Parliament before the verdict and called on the tribunal to take into account what the Shahbag protesters were demanding. Now that, of course, is a direct interference with the independence of, um, impartiality of the judiciary. What followed was the death sentence for Saidi. So they've effectively taken into account the will of the people. And of course, that is very serious. The Prime Minister is telling the country, the people and everybody that they should hear the voice of the people. I see nothing wrong with in it. The change in the law that has been made was to make, uh, to make a equality in the right to appeal by both the prosecution and the uh, uh, other side. That is why you said that while a person who has been convicted can go to the higher court to reduce his sentence, a person who, is, who feels aggrieved that the proper, uh, that uh, highest punishment was not given to the perpetrator can also go to the Supreme Court and demand that he should be given highest punishment. That is what was only done, nothing else. It came a bit late though, didn't it? Because you didn't have that at the beginning. It was only that when is, you heard the verdict your, of imprisonment. That is and then when opinion. everyone started asking for the death penalty, yeah. that's all of a sudden, that's when you started to change your tune, isn't it? So uh, No, it's not our why tune. Why didn't you just admit it, it is, that enough. actually you were just, you were, you were dissatisfied with the original verdict? Uh, the, the, the families of the victim, if they are dissatisfied, I repeat it, if they are dissatisfied and if they are demanding that they should also, they should still ask, can ask for higher punishment, they have been, that facility has been given to them and whichever way you want to interpret is up, you have the right to do that. Protests are also taking place in support of the Jamaat leaders. Large numbers of Bangladeshis have taken to the streets calling for a fair trial and accusing the government of corruption. Ordinary Bangladeshis have always been largely political, but for the last one month their presence on the streets shows just how much endurance they have in their respective beliefs. If placards were matches, surely Bangladesh would be on fire tonight. And there are no signs of abating. The Bangladeshi Prime Minister repeats her full confidence in a court she set up. Her party's president says he has no trouble sleeping over the death sentence delivered to Saidi. And the world watches on, unable to interfere in what Bangladesh has clearly produced as a domestic court. At around 150 this weekend, the death toll is rapidly rising. 42 years after the war ended, Pakistani army officers accused of war crimes walk free, while Bangladeshis turn on each other. Tomorrow evening we continue our special report and look at what could be wider political motivations for the trial. Ghulam Azam's defence team started their closing remarks this morning. It'll take them a week to close their case and a verdict can be expected within a month after. If the previous decisions are anything to go by, a sentence of any kind on Ghulam Azam will trigger further protests and objections. Given what we know of the ICT so far, is all of this merely symbolic? In part two, we look at Sheikh Hasina's political opponents and the idea that she's trying to drive them out. And we ask, have Bangladeshis had enough of Islam?